All right, guys. Well, it has suddenly gone from a lovely to a gray, gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, where we have stumbled into Friday, September 24th, 2021. So, since it is Friday, it is time for our very first fall of 2021. Uh, ecological meltdown around our rant where we go over there check in with our friends at mongabay.com to see what is on the minds of Rhett Butler and the boys and girls at mongabay.com now that the summer of 2021 has rolled out probably a good place to start we're gonna start up uh, at the top of the world Manga Bay doesn't spend a lot of time up in the Arctic, so uh, we'll see how their, what their report is. <clears throat> Researchers express alarm as Arctic multi-year sea ice hits record low. Low sea ice concentration can create a misleading picture of sea ice health in the Arctic, Though sea ice extent, this was being reported in the mainstream media, though sea ice extent is only at its 10th lowest since satellite records began in 1979, the waters north of Alaska this September are full of diffuse ice. And if you're wondering what this means, of great concern to scientists, the Arctic has lost 95% of its thick multi-year sea ice since 1985. Older, thicker ice acts as a buffer against future blue ocean events. Yes, the infamous BOE expected according to whoever wrote this report expected as early as 2035 uh, a BOE would mark a year when most Arctic ice melts out in the summer and of course then the big question is when we have the infamous blue ocean event what is that going to mean I honestly don't know I I, for the record, uh, for whatever that means, I'm no climatologist any more than this dog is. Uh, I am not on the the camp that we're going to have a blue ocean event and then humans are going to be extinct the next year. I I I, I have seen no evidence presented to me by anybody that humans are going to be extinct because of a blue ocean event. Uh, it's just one more sign of the collapse of a planet. Uh, why they pick this particular sign of the collapse to be a trigger uh, of human extinction. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> I'm already getting off into a, uh, a rant about places and people we do not talk about on this channel. So uh, let's get back to uh, Manga Bay now. We're going to go from sea ice to wherever coral reefs are left on the planet with coral cover, from sea ice cover to coral cover, with coral cover halved Curbing climate change is now the only way to slow the loss. A new study estimates that global coral cover, coral, I got to start learning how to talk like a Yankee living up here in New York, baby. Uh, we call it coral uh, where I grew up in Georgia. But whatever you call it is doomed. Uh, coral, coral, whatever. Uh, is half of what it was in the 1950s back when I was born with much of that loss linked to human-driven climate change. The shrinking 
of core rule cover has translated into a 60% loss in reef biodiversity. Reef fish catches peaked in 2002 and have been declining ever since. And they will keep declining until there are no more reef fishes because there will be no more reefs. And uh, anyway, guys, take it from there. Um, and again, uh, guys, uh, I'm only going to have time to touch upon a few of these articles uh, here in this <coughs> overloaded laundry list. Let's look at sea turtles. I love when Rhett asks a question. Uh, the question on Rhett's mind uh, this week, <coughs> sea turtles, can these great marine migrators navigate rising human threats? The answer to your question, Rhett, if you're listening to this, you already know the answer to this question. But uh, I will answer it for you. The answer is no. Sea turtles will not be able to navigate rising human threats. <clears throat> I love how he starts this out. Humanity is quickly crossing critical planetary boundaries that threaten sea turtle populations, their ecosystems, and ultimately the safe operating space for human existence. Exactly as go the sea turtles, we go too. Now, of course, we are going to obliterate every sea turtle off the face of the planet before we go, but uh, these good old tipping points. <clears throat> sea turtles have, well, until now, survived for millions of years, but marathon migrations put them at increasing risk for the additive impacts of adverse anthropogenic activity, meaning humans killing them. That is a long way. Additive, ad, additive impacts of adverse anthropogenic activity. That is a long way for saying humans killing them. I don't know why they can't just use these little, you know. Uh, okay, killing them on land and at sea, including, you know, human impacts from biodiversity loss, climate change, ocean acidification, land use changes, pollution, especially plastic pollution, and more. Uh, I like this, yeah. Avoiding extinction will require adaptation by turtles and people. Yes. Uh, you know, guys, whenever I read this uh, stuff about sea turtles, particularly climate change, uh, I don't know, I, I haven't read the full story is, uh, sea turtles breed on beaches, on tropical beaches. The first ecosystem to, well, I guess mangroves are going to be the very first e uh, ecosystem taken out by sea level rise, but sea turtle nesting beaches are going underwater. Uh, they will have nowhere to build nests. You cannot build dig a, a nest in the middle of a, I don't know, a Howard Johnson's uh, or, you know, Highway A1A. Uh, if, if everything else doesn't get them, uh, sea level rise. Uh, I, I have never seen one story 
where it just spells this out. Uh, anyway, as long as we're talking about planetary boundaries, don't forget nitrogen. Nitrogen, the environmental crisis you have not heard of yet. Actually, uh, and now of course I'm having a brain fart. I, I interviewed some fellow, who was it, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the big researchers. The whole interview was talking about the, the boring subject of the nitrogen cycle that uh, people do not understand that ni the nitrogen cycle, uh, that global industrial civilization. This is more for humans, that uh, global industrial civilization is 100% dependent on nitrogen. And, uh, but anyway, if you you know, night, the nitrogen cycle, it's kind of like the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. If you want to clear out a, a room full of people, uh, just say the word nitrogen cycle and uh, watch your friends disappear out of the room. <clears throat> the creation of synthetic fertilizers in the early 20th century was a turning point in human history enabling an increase in crop yields and causing a population boom. It is, uh, it, it is the nitrogen fertilizer invention right up there with fossil fuels. And of course, the, the nitrogen fertilizer process uses a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, there would not be nearly as many people on this planet if it had not been uh, for the creation of synthetic fertilizers. But the overuse of nitrogen and phosphorus from those fertilizers is causing an environmental crisis as algae blooms in oceanic dead zones grow in scale and frequency of the nine planetary boundaries that scientists say we must not cross in order to sustain human life, the boundary associated with nitrogen and phosphorus waste has been far surpassed, putting Earth's operating system at risk. Yes. Uh... So we will look at the major reforms to agribusiness practices. Uh, it is the nitrogen planetary boundary that we have already passed farther than any other one. All right, uh, here's an article about how the world's small cats are completely screwed. Uh, anyway, uh, I think we all know that. Uh, okay, if you've heard of this stuff called shea butter, S-H-E-A, I never knew till this minute that shea butter came from a tree. So, this is a real shocking thing. Shea trees are falling fast across Africa, victims of new pressures. Despite the seeming bounty of shea butter products in markets and on beauty counters globally, little known threats to shea trees are, are looming. Yes, and the vice president of Ghana, there you go, has declared the threat to shea parklands, the agricultural landscapes dotted with shea trees in grain fields, a national priority. Uh, 
Anyway, kiss goodbye these shade trees. Get out there and grab all the shade butter while you still can. Again, guys, I am skipping over probably uh, probably on on more than half of these. Okay, let's uh, visit. Jair Bozo Nero's UN speech, you know, where uh, Bozo Nero uh, was up there. And several of you have sent me articles that that hilarious speech, you, you know, Jair Bozo Nero talking about how Brazil is getting serious about curbing Amazon deforestation and uh, cutting the carbon emissions or whatever, this crap coming out of that planet eater's mouth. Okay. Countering Bozo Nero's UN speech, Greenpeace releases Amazon deforestation photos. Just hours after Brazilian President Jair or Bozo Nero painted a rosy picture of his administration's environmental record during a knee-slapping United Nations speech, Greenpeace and other environmental groups released a set of photos showing continued deforestation and fires in Earth's largest rainforest. Yes, speaking to the UN in New York on Tuesday, Bozo Nero claimed a 32% reduction in deforestation in the month of August relative to a year ago. And of course, don't forget the country's near decade old forest code, which is a joke. It has nothing to do with him and he has done everything in his power to take whatever teeth were in it and lands set aside as indigenous territories, which Bozo Nero has fought to undermine and dismantle as evidence of Brazil's contributions toward mitigating climate change. Hmm. But activists pushed back on Bozo Nero's statements noting rising deforestation in the Amazon and his administration's rollback of environmental laws and law enforcement while publishing dramatic images captured in two Amazon states between September 14th and 17th. You know, while he was making these statements, uh, Greenpeace was down there uh, snapping pictures, you know, proving what a lying S of S he is. Uh, there you go. Under Bozo Nero, the deforestation rate in the Amazon has climbed to the highest level since 2008. There you go. When I first read this headline, I read it, thanks to the Yurok tribe, condoms will return to the Pacific Northwest. I think I need a, a new 99 cent pair of glasses. So, uh, <laughs> well, that's too bad that condoms will not be returning to the Pacific Northwest, but thanks to the Yurok tribe, condors will return to the Pacific Northwest. All right. Uh, the first four condors will be released uh, in Northern California next spring. Okay. Uh, so what is the newest research on fires in the Amazon rainforest, which I'm quite sure Bozo Nero did not mention this article uh, in his speech to the, uh, to the United Nations. Fires in the Amazon 
have already impacted 90%, 90% of plant and animal species. A new study addresses the effects of fires on biodiversity loss in the world's largest rainforest during the last two decades. Researchers measure the impacts on the habitats of 14,000 species of plants and animals, finding that 93 to 95 percent suffered consequences of the fires. Primates were the most affected as they depend on trees. There you go. Primates were the most affected as they depend on trees for movement, food, and shelter. Uh, rare and endemic species with restricted habitats suffered the strongest impacts. Uh, there you go. All right. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention uh, hopium. Uh, you know, I do my hopium roundup rant tomorrow. I, I think I already have a full roundup, so uh, we have enough hopium coming in tomorrow. I don't need to waste your time with any uh, hopium from Manga Bay. Okay, what can the Mauritius Kestrel teach us about wildlife reintroductions? All right. Using decades of data, a recent study analyzed long-term population trends for the Mauritius Kestrel, a bird of prey endemic to the island of Mauritius, which was at one time considered the rarest bird in the world. All right, and then it went from being the rarest bird in the world, and when they really cracked down on protecting it, they brought the population up to 400 individuals by the 1990s, and then they said, well, they're recovered, and so we're done here. Well, they went back and recounted them, and guess what? They're down to 250. Uh, scientists linked this decline to a halt in monitoring efforts, which occurred, ironically, after the species' conservation status had improved and prompted conservation donors to stop funding any further recovery efforts. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I would say this uh, is, is a great cautionary tale about what is going on with gray wolves, uh, in, in, you know, in the U.S. that uh, after all of this work, decades and decades of work to finally start bringing the wolf population back in the 48 states to, you know, a tiny fraction of what it used to be. Uh, you know, Donald Trump went in there in his last, what was it, his last week in office, I think, and, and stripped federal protection uh, of gray wolves. And as goes the Mauritius Kestrel, so goes the wolf. Now, I do think, uh, I'm probably being naive here, I do think our planet-saving president, Joe Biden is going to, uh, if, if he can think straight for five minutes, uh, he's going to put gray wolves back on the endangered species list. Uh, but by the time uh, that doddering old fart gets around to it, they're going to be back down to where they were 50 years ago. Anyway... Let's see, what is going on with bushmeat consumption? This is one for uh, the Bill Gatey. Uh, <laughs> if you've heard of my interview with Bill Gatey claiming that we're going to eat 
every one of our fellow Earthlings. Here's more evidence for the Bill Gatey uh, theory on the sixth mass extinction. <clears throat> Domestic bushmeat consumption is an urgent threat to migratory mammals migratory mammals and any other mammal. They don't, you know, migratory and non-migratory mammals. I, I guess this is another dire, another recent dire UN report has found that many migratory mammals are in grave danger of being hunted for meat for domestic consumption, which in many cases poses an even greater risk to population numbers than international wildlife trade. And so guys, this is one, this is the difference between planet nibbling and planet eating. Okay, the, the wildlife trade, you know, of course, China being the number one uh, player in that, you know, that is planet eating. Uh, domestic bushmeat consumption is planet nibbling. This is where, uh, you, you know, these folks who are always being said, they're not doing anything to, uh, to you know, to raise carbon emissions. No. Uh, well, while they're not raising carbon emissions, what do you think they're doing? They're eating their fellow earthlings. Uh, humans are humans. Uh, anyway, uh, the authors say that while wild meat consumption cannot be eliminated because it is an indispensable source of nutrition and income for rural communities, they call for improved national regulations. Yeah, good luck on that. All of this is making me hungry for a venison burger. We and Sandy, we enjoyed some delicious venison burgers. Uh, I'm looking forward maybe to uh, having a, a corn-fed venison burger. If, some, if anybody wants to come up here to Bugs in a Jar Farm and harvest some corn-fed venison uh, from about 100 feet from this house, get in touch with me. I just want some of the goodies from the corpse. All right. Okay, so Rhett has, I guess he's crunched the numbers on uh, he has crunched the numbers on 11 Manga Bay investigations in two years, and here's what they found. Yes, two years ago, Manga Bay and his partners launched a project dedicated to revealing corruption and collusion at the core of many natural resource industries around the world. Hmm, take a wild guess what the results were. The results, or, or the overall result, was observable impacts in multiple sectors, including government agencies, international financial institutions, otherwise known as the banksters behind it all, local communities, and civil society organizations. Uh, they were particularly investigating cattle ranching, fisheries, minerals, palm oil, soybeans, sunflower oil, and timber. Yes, some findings exposed contradictory actions from sustainability statements of financial institutions. Wow, imagine that. How about mining encroachment on indigenous lands? Hmm, suspicious payments made to unnamed consultants by palm oil conglomerates and broken promise broken promises of land rights. 
Do you think so? Anyway, guys, I had my rant uh, about that uh, that dolphin slaughter by those evil SOBs up there on the Faroe Islands. Faroe Islands to evaluate, yes, Faroe Islands to evaluate traditional hunt after the slaughter of 1,400 dolphins, the killing of 1,428 Atlantic white-sided dolphins in the Faroe Islands has sparked outrages uh, among both local, you know, among the local people and attracted international criticism over the legitimacy of such hunts. Yes, the Faroese Prime Minister announced that his government will evaluate the recent dolphin hunt as well as the tradition's place in society, meaning uh, in the year 2021. Uh, Good Lord, wow, how many times have we heard this one? Uh, can you say Chinese Belt and Road Initiative? Railroad and mine projects stir up anxiety in rural Brazilian communities. Construction, you know, of this planet-eating railway we've been talking about for the past couple of years, linking a deep water port in Bahia State to an inland highway is fully underway following a successful bid by the region's largest iron ore miner. Besides transporting 18 million metric tons of iron ore every year, the railroad will have the capacity to transport an additional 42 million tons of cargo, yes, including grain, uh, and uh, this will also be affecting Brazil's fastest growing agricultural frontier, which is actually the Cerrado. Uh, people and of course, you know, uh, people living there in the path of the railway are already reporting cases of property and environmental damage and broken agreements with the community. Yes, residents say they fear that agribusiness will invade their lands hmm. and that a tailings dam proposed by the mine could collapse with deadly consequences. Then we have a story about chimpanzees uh, looking at uh, climate change taking out chimpanzees in the future. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go full book hermit here, guys. Uh, while I have no doubt that if, if there is nothing else going on with chimpanzees in sub-Saharan Africa, that climate change would eventually uh, obliterate them off the planet. Chimpanzees are, are going to be long extinct in the wild in sub-Saharan Africa before climate change finishes them off. Humans, with no help from climate change, are going to obliterate every chimpanzee off the face of this planet uh, in, in many other ways. So I don't know the point of this research. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we mentioned this one last week, but we're going to wrap it up here. If you missed it last week, and if you're the if you are actually still listening to me, 
an environmental catastrophe in southern Africa lingers. Well, about 10,000 or about 1.4 billion environmental catastrophes linger in Africa. In early August, as reported here already, reports began to surface of a major spill of toxic runoff from an Angolan diamond mine into rivers that feed into the Democratic Republic of Congo's waterways. The spill has now turned hundreds of miles of the Congo River's tributaries a deep shade of red. Uh, there you go. While the mines operators did admit to the spill, they have downplayed its severity and deny that any toxic substances were discharged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, guys, I have to wrap this up because uh, I'm in the middle of dealing with some clueless moron on Airbnb. And I uh, just got a note from them. I have to go play Airbnb host. <sighs> Talking about having uh, feet in two worlds. Say bye-bye. Let's go deal with play Airbnb host. Uh, get out there and enjoy Airbnb while you still can. Bye, guys.